The Lord is with you. We welcome everyone to our worship here on this, at least we're taping this on Saturday, and for those that are here, it's a rainy, cold day, uh, but what joy to gather under God's gifts and with his people here this morning. We welcome all those who are online. Today, we're going to be looking at our epistle reading and the sacrifice of love. It's an interesting scenario that's played out in this particular reading. Uh, but it's about being right. You can be right about something, but wrong at the same time, especially as it relates to our neighbor, and hence the theme, the sacrifice of love. In the atrium here at church, we have a library that's been set up. Uh, uh, Helen has done a real nice job of setting up books there and so forth, so feel free to check those out. There's a, there's a, a booklet that you can sign in there, and there she's going to continue to get more books, but wanted to let you know of that. Next week, we are starting a new Bible class on Paul's missionary journeys to the ends of the earth. We will be watching this in class on Sunday morning. There's a kind of a video component to it. And if you're interested to sign up for this and you're not able to make it on Sunday morning, uh, please send me your in email information and I'll, we'll sign you up and send you the video link. A uh, really exciting thing is we consider the mission of our church, what better thing to do than to look at the mission early mission work of Paul uh, in the book of Acts. Handbells is going to begin this week on Wednesday night, please note that. And this week, Epiphany Mission Highlight is St. Paul Lutheran High School in Concordia, Missouri. Pastor Tice, your former pastor, I believe went there and you will encounter many people uh, who have gone to that uh, schooling, that school. Uh, and you can find out information about that in, in your bulletin. So St. Paul Lutheran 
uh, High School in Concordia, Missouri. Uh, one thing I did find interesting is that 37% of the students that go to that school are from other countries uh, right now. So that, that was interesting to me. God's richest blessings on your worship as we begin with the first hymn. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We take a moment for silent confession. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Let's do that. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. 
Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. with you let us pray pray almighty God you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations through Jesus Christ your son our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen you may be seated Our first reading for this, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 18. Just as God raised up Moses, he will raise up a new prophet, and we know that that prophet is our Lord Jesus. In this text, he also gives a warning to those uh, to not follow those who say, claim to speak for God, but ultimately do not speak for God. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again from the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command you. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, this will be the basis of the message here today. It speaks of the sacrifice of love for
for our neighbor as people of God. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone who loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all thing, are all things, and from whom we exist, and one Lord. Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In this section of Scripture, we see the unique authority of our Lord, both in what He says and in how He acts. And that authority is given on our behalf to bless us. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they question among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our common faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
You may be seated as at this time we have our children's message. And I see Evie out there. How are you, Evie? Good to see you, good to see you, and good to see everybody here. Uh, and I see someone else here, maybe for a children's message. And of course, we're all children of God. Uh, and so we're going to talk about having authority. You know, you get somebody that speaks and you listen to them and you listen to them because they have authority, they have a position. So this person right here is a teacher. Now, if somebody walked off the street and just started talking to a bunch of kids, they'd say, well, why should we listen to this guy? He's not a teacher, but this guy's a teacher. So you tend to listen to somebody, or hopefully you listen to those that are teachers. Let's go to the next picture here. And this person is probably some sort of, well, government official. Now we, okay, tend to listen to those who are in positions of uh, authority, like a government official. I know there's some things with that, but we should listen to them, what they have to say. And so this guy, we listen to, all right? I don't know who it is, but uh, if he's in the position, he speaks and we listen because he is a, has that authority. Let's go to the next one here. Okay, so Jesus went into a, a, a kind of a church. They call it a synagogue. And he went up to kind of a place right here where he would do a reading. And they would have visitors come and do readings. And he was a visiting teacher. And he spoke. And sometimes when you hear somebody speak, you're just kind of not paying attention. But boy, when he spoke, everybody paid attention. We'll go to the next picture here. All right, he spoke and he spoke with authority because he would say, I say to you, the kingdom of God is at hand. Whoa, they didn't hear anybody speak like that before. This was powerful, and they were listening to him. Okay, we'll go to the next picture here. But there was a little bit of a ruckus in the back of the church, and somebody was kind of, he had an evil spirit, kind of scary stuff, and he says, who are you? You're the son of God, you're come to destroy us. Well, that would make you nervous, wouldn't it? Everybody would get a little nervous about that. And they were getting nervous about that. But here's what Jesus did. We'll go to the next picture here. He spoke to that evil spirit and that man. He said, come out of him. Be well. And Yevi, what do you think happened? Did the spirit come out of him? Yeah, it did. It did. It completely came out. And he was so relieved because he felt so much better. And they thought, wow. He has authority not just to speak, but he does something. He can cast out an evil spirit. My goodness, who is this guy? We'll go to the next picture here. Okay, and look at the guy. Before he was not happy, he was making a, a, agitating things, but look at him now. Does he look happy, Evie? Guy that's sitting there? He sure does. He says, thank you, Jesus. Boy, I had it so tough, but you've come along. You spoke this way, and wow. Okay. So Jesus has authority more than your parents and teachers and government authorities. And what does Jesus bring? We're going to go to the next picture here. Now, I don't know if you can see all these words, but I'm going to explain it. Some of you kids that are watching online. Jesus, your Savior, has authority over the devil himself. He's not more powerful than Jesus. No, no, no. Evie, shake your head. No, no, no. Can you shake your head like this? No, no, no. He doesn't have power over Jesus. He's got power over sin in life. Evie, shake your head like this. No, he can't. He can't. Doesn't, he has authority over that. Sin's not more powerful than him and over death. He has authority over death. Doesn't have power over Jesus. Jesus has authority over death. And that's why Jesus is like no one else. He's a Savior who has great authority. All right. Let's have a prayer. And please join with Evie in this prayer as you uh, do this echo prayer with me. Oh Lord, you sent forth Jesus who has authority over evil spirits, the devil, the world, and our sin. And that is great news for us. In your name we pray. Amen. We sing the next hymn.
Jesus, who has sacrificed for us and calls us to live in sacrificial live a life uh, to those around us. The burden of living under a religion by which your relationship to God is defined by how good you are, how faithful you have been, and how committed you are to God and His laws can be crushing if that's what defines your relationship with God. In fact, to think that we can do this, we can maintain and start and keep this relationship with God, it assumes that we are born good, and that we are at least capable of partially establishing a connection to God by our efforts. There's a movie out called The American Gospel, and it speaks against the prosperity gospel movement movement that God will bless you if you do certain things and so forth. Uh, it's well worth your time to take a look at. I've seen parts of it here before. And that brings this out very well within that particular movie. The truth is, though, that we cannot do this, which is why Jesus Christ landing in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit is so essential. That's the gospel. Jesus rescues those incapable of reaching out to him. That's what makes the gospel good news, super good news for those who can't reach out to him, which is us. You see that gospel is given to those who, in the, who the word of God says are dead in sin and completely incapable of climbing the ladder, even the first step to God. But rather than being crushed by our inabilities and failures, we are released from our debts. Our life with God is no longer determined by how committed we are to Him, how good we have been, because none of us can meet that standard by which God has for us, but only the Son, His Son, Jesus. But rather, through faith in this, this Son, Jesus, who loves us and gave Himself for us, we are completely connected, not partially connected, but completely connected to this God. And Paul writes, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke, that crushing yoke of slavery of not doing enough. Galatians 2.21 says this, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. There's your memory verse this week. Just keep that in mind. It's a fabulous verse there. Case closed. This is what we have. This is what we should treasure. It's a wonderful thing. And yet, as believers who have the righteousness of Christ placed upon us as a gift, we also, until we leave this life here on earth, have what's called an old Adam, our sinful nature. And this can twist this great truth of freedom in Christ and twist it in such a way that those God has placed around us, fellow believers, are in fact harmed by the way we view this wonderful teaching. All right, so there's the starting point here. All of that is said to get into our text from 1 Corinthians today. Here was the issue at hand. And it sounds a bit strange to us, but it does fit in a number of aspects of our life. In pagan temples in Corinth, they would have sacrifices. And the meat that they sacrifice or they sacrifice to false gods, untrue gods. The question at hand was this: can a Christian eat meat sacrificed? at a pagan temple if you weren't at the pagan temple but you were at a market somewhere in the same vicinity or in that town this meat was left over as I mentioned and at local markets all people ate at these markets including Christian believers 
those who had been believers for a while and new converts to the faith. Now, those who had been around a while, believers for a while, mature believers, knew that these idols were not true. There's only one God. And that all you are doing is eating and not joining in worship when you're at a market eating this particular meat. Now, Paul would say that if you're in the temple of worship, well, that's something you probably shouldn't do at their temple. But eating the meat at these markets, well, in and of itself would not be problematic because there's no such thing as these false idols. In your freedom, go ahead, eat this meat. Yet there were some believers who were troubled by this because it reminded them of their old way of doing things. They remembered how dark their life was before Christ, and it was a life of false worship, a life of devoid of the cross and the light of Christ. And so their conscience was burdened every time they went into the market to this old way they perceived of living. And they would be tempted to go back to these old ways. That's where their friends were, that's where family was, that's kind of what was going on, so the temptation was there. Now here's the rub. Those believers who knew this, that this meat did not mean false worship, failed to love other believers who by doing this, their consciences were burdened because it hit too close to home of their previous life. Now Paul, this was a, an issue at hand, obviously not an issue before us, at least in our time right here today in this community. But Paul puts it this way. All of us possess knowledge, that is, good teaching here, and knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Yes, you have the freedom to eat, but we are also to love those who we are in the faith to help them in their walk with God. It's not just about this, it is about this, but it's about the impact on those around us, especially fellow believers. When this relationship is established by the grace of God, it's not about us anymore. <laughs> it's as if this relationship, it's about God and it's our neighbor. And if food, here's what the text says, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, even though I could, lest I make my brother stumble. That's the quote that Paul has here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, even as believers, we have something called the old nature. You see this in many places of scriptures. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's not written to unbelievers. That's written to believers. We still have this old nature, our old Adam, within us until the day we are brought to heaven. And the way it often rears its ugly head is something called pride. Pride puts us at the center of all things. It has been around a very long time. It seems that Satan was kicked out of heaven because of pride. Didn't like being an angel of God, but wanted more significance there. He wasn't satisfied being under God. So also Adam and Eve fell into sin because they didn't like being under God. They wanted to be equal and, of course, above him, decide for themselves what is good and evil. So it's been around a long time. Pride is so self-centered it fails to look toward God. It can't see those around us. And I love this quote by a man by the name of David Rhodes. He's an author, and he wrote this about pride. Pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its root goes deep, only a little left behind sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks, and it flourishes in good soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. They were right in eating this meat, but in the process, they were being prideful and not concerning themselves with others. You can be right and wrong at the same time. Now, Paul says these words, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And he's not saying that knowledge and truth is wrong. He's not pitting these two things against one another. 
And we know this from the rest of Scripture. He's not saying love in place of knowledge. He really wants to hold two up there at the same time. Knowledge God has given us and love towards others are both important. We get in trouble when we kind of go one route without the other. Let's just take the knowledge part. Knowledge concerning sin, that it is something we are born into, that we have an old nature, <clears throat> clarifies why Christ is so central in our life. We have a misunderstanding of the power of sin and of evil. We're going to have a misunderstanding of the power of Christ in our life. The knowledge and the truth of one God, three persons, which we just confessed in the Nicene Creed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, is so central to scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, the first commandment says we are to have no other gods before him. And we know that the true God is the triune God as expressed from Genesis to Revelation. Another knowledge thing that's good or truth that's good, and there's many here, the truth that Jesus really did live. He really was without sin and that he physically died and physically rose. This is the foundation of of our hope and our redemption. It's a very specific foundation that we have. And then this knowledge is brought into our lives in a wonderful way. The knowledge and truth of baptism is a gift from God which delivers the best blessings of Christ in a very personal way. And it's not that I was baptized, but I am baptized. I am claimed by God in Christ. It's very important. This is also language concerning the importance of truth and knowledge. 1 Peter 3 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, In Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge brought our way by the Holy Spirit through the Word is not to be disregarded. Okay? Point well taken. You probably got it there. But you can be right on the knowledge end and wrong at the same time. Right about being free in Christ but wrong in carrying this truth in a way that does not consider those around you for whom Christ also died. Rather than eat meat, willingly sacrifice, go without it, of love for your neighbor and refrain from such action if that would cause them some sort of temptation. Now, let's see how this plays out in our world or for us uh, at our time. Greg Lockwood, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, writes that in early missionary work in Papua New Guinea, the earliest converts often resisted suggestion from missionaries that they use traditional music, like their particular drum, I think it's called the kundu drum, for, as instruments in their worship services. You know, this is what you have, this is what's in your community, use this. Well, they explained that they could not hear these instruments without hearing the voice of the spirits, which was in their former life, pre-Christian life. To later generations of believers, this was not an issue, and so the drums were used. Maybe another parallel might be drinking around someone who struggles with a drinking addiction. Certainly believers have the right to drink in moderation, that seems to be clear in Scripture, but is that right to flaunt against our neighbor who now deals with that particular temptation. Again, you might refrain for the sake of your neighbor. Again, the freedom we have in Christ frees us to love and also not to discourage those who are in the faith. Martin Luther once said, it's always good to quote Martin Luther here, Martin Luther once said, and I love this quote, a Christian is perfectly free Lord of all Subject to none. That is, we have great freedom. We're accountable to Christ. We can live in that freedom. And if you want to go through what freedom is all about, how important it is, just look at the book of Galatians. Now you're free. Live as free people. So you're perfectly free, subject to none. But then he also says this. A Christian is perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject of all, subject to all. In other words, we are now debted to those around us. That's our new life. In fact, it's a life lived outside of ourselves. Now the old nature doesn't like this, we'll work against this, use pride, but it's lived outside of ourselves, upward and outward. Upward to God, outward to those around us. 
Our glorious calling is freedom before God and faith in this God and service and love to our neighbor, which sometimes means a sacrifice of love. Now there's a paradox here, and what do you mean by paradox? It's two seemingly two opposite truths held up at the same time. For the Corinthians and for us, it's not just about eating and drinking, but what you do and can't do. It's about sacrificial love for those whom our Savior died. May the Lord lead us through the power of the Spirit to live joyfully in this freedom all our days and also to live in fervent love toward others in any way we can through the power of the Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would invite you to rise for prayer. Additional prayers today on behalf of Wayne Mann. We've been praying for him who's had heart surgery. This is the brother-in-law of Janine Consolano. Uh, he has now been diagnosed with cancer, so we'll pray for him and his family. And we're also praying for uh, Diane Barron's family. Uh, Diane's, um, uh, Anne Dowdy, Diane's mom, passed away this morning. And these are friends of the Haberl, or connection to the Haberl family. So we'll pray for the... Um, the fam, their family. Let us pray. Almighty God, as you have redeemed us by the gospel without any merit or worthiness in our part, so help us to live in love and consideration to those for whom you have died. Let not pride get in the way of our Holy Spirit given connections to you, nor get in the way of serving those you have called us to serve. Lord, in your mercy, well, Lord, we give you thanks for 55 years of marriage that John and Jean Kirk have experienced, as well as the 50th birthday of their son, Jason Kirk. As they all celebrate these milestones, help them to always know and treasure that marriage and life itself are gifts from above. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Lord, you who have redeemed us as your own, grant to the families of Julie Sharp, Delma Arbeiter, Charles Davis, and Ann Dowdy, your peace as they mourn the earthly loss of those whom they love. We thank you for the lives of these individuals that you gave them this side of heaven, for granting them faith and a chance to serve others and receive your gifts, uh, gifts uh, in the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, help and, strength, help and strengthen those who are recovering, living with COVID-19 and dealing with cancer treatments. Especially we pray for Gary, Chris, Wayne, Mann, Shirley, Marge, Hazel, Mike, Ed, Sean, Tracy, Bob, Carol, Jan, Marion, David, Hal, Ann, Dale, and Cheryl, along with those we name silently. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, guard our families and homes and build them up in love. Support parents in their tasks of instructing their children. Strengthen those whose faith is weak and make us bold to forgo convenience and security to attest to the truths of our most holy faith with heart and action. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, give health and success to our president and governor, our legislators and judges, and all who serve our for our governance and protection. Make them high in purpose, wise in counsel, and unwavered in duty. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray for Brian, Jennifer, Oliver, Larry, Paulette, Kyle, and Nathan Kremel, fellow members of your kingdom and members here at St. Paul's. Continue through the power of your Holy Spirit. Give them hope, peace, and strength in Christ as they continue to serve the Savior who never stops serving us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what has been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You once proclaimed your saving promise through the prophets of Israel, and by the apostles and evangelists you published the good news of your saving promise fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Grant that we, being instructed in the doctrine of the blessed apostles and evangelists, may faithfully eat his body and drink his blood, and declare his salvation to all the world. Amen. You may be seated. This body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who truly set you free. May this strengthen you in the true faith and to life everlasting. Go in his peace and in his joy. And let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn.